the best way I could find to be human after telling stories of children dying, but especially after telling stories of perpetrators explaining exactly how they tortured people. And in some cases, I remember vividly listening to a man who I knew well because he was one of the secret police uh, officers who had questioned me, telling in detail how he tortured a close friend of mine, um, a guy who was in our Youth for Christ youth group, the victim. This is a version of Psalm 137 that if I had it better on the screen, I would ask you to pray with me. It's a liturgical version done by Roy Birkenbosch, uh, who's a chaplain at King's University College in Edmonton. So pray with me. I won't ask you to do call and response, but here we go. Hear the sorrowful word of the Lord. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the weeping willows we hung our instruments of joy. Our captors asked us to sing songs of home. Our oppressors demanded songs of joy. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. If I lose hope and make peace with exile, may my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I forget the holy center of wonder and heartbreak and hope, there will be no song to sing in a strange land. Remember, O Lord, what happened the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, our enemies cried. Tear it down to its foundation. O daughter of Babylon, all enemies of Shalom are doomed to destruction. A reward awaits the one who overturns your evil, who exacts justice for your cruelty, who denies a future to your cause. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? I think Roy Birkenbosch in this liturgical version of the prayer interprets it for us, but he softens it. Because that's not really how the song ends. Roy does it this way. A reward awaits the one who denies a future to your cause. But the poet says something like this. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. In 1996 and 1997, I was a Christian believer. I still am. For two years, this was my prayer, my only prayer. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm complicit in, uh, in apartheid, and I benefited from it. I had violin lessons for $12 a year when I was 10 years old. I had a healthcare system better than that of Sweden. So I benefited from this political structure that my, my parents had helped to build in South Africa. I was not praying prayers of confession over my complicity in 1996 and 1997. I was praying that God would bless their hands that took by their ankles the babies of the men who tortured my friends to dash their brains out on a rock. And you know what? I actually think that's okay to pray that for two years. It's in the Psalter. It's a prayer of the people of God. It's not the only prayer 
It's about 150th of the prayers. So maybe I should have prayed for a shorter portion of my life. But really it was the only way in which I could connect to God and be human during those two years. Four days a week, I spent eight to 12 hours a day telling stories of children dying, of men having naked electrical wires wrapped around their testicles. And I needed to speak to God. This is all I could say to him. Psalm 137. Mark Galley, who works for Christianity Today, says this. We are a naive and sentimental people if we equate love with mere social grace and think that niceness, and I say this as a Canadian, will successfully confront the massive and intransigent evils of our day, individual and corporate. Redemption, personal, social, and cosmic, comes only through suffering. The paradox is that while we should not wish pain on anyone, it seems to be a perfectly loving and realistic act to pray for it. Now, it, it didn't stop there, you know, my personal moral formation in that setting. It got worse. As I struggled with the evil that I saw out there in my neighbors, I could not but wonder what this meant about God. I mean, frankly, where the hell was he? And so part of what I prayed in those two years was Psalm 88. Pray with me just the final verses of Psalm 88 in Eugene Peterson's version from the message. I am standing my ground, God, shouting for help. At my prayers every morning on my knees each daybreak, why, God, do you turn a deaf ear? Why do you make yourself scarce? For as long as I remember, I've been hurting. I've taken the worst you can hand out, and I've had it. Your wildfire anger has blazed through my life. I'm bleeding, black and blue. You've attacked me fiercely from every side, raining down blows till I'm nearly dead. You made lover and neighbor alike dump me. The only friend I have left is darkness. God in his good providence prepared me for 1996 and 1997 in 1995. We had a small group in our home, meeting in our home in 1995, of mostly um, young medical professionals, doctors and nurses. And they were working in a completely overcrowded and ill-equipped hospital in our city, uh, dealing with mayhem and babies being born uh, in equal parts, stitching up uh, people's heads that were split, split open with machetes uh, over drinks on a Friday night after people were paid their weekly wages. And uh, my friends uh, asked to, to read together a few chapters out of a book by Eugene Peterson called um, Working the Angles. And so in 95, we learned to pray uh, Psalms of Lament. And he took us to, to several other um, uh, books on the Psalms that I'll mention to you tomorrow. 